If this is one of the first times you've been looking at an instrument approach procedure chart, you might be confused about all the elements that are on there. So let's have a look at the basics of an instrument approach procedure chart. This is the VOR for runway 34 at Carroll County Airport in Maryland. It's a relatively simple approach plate, but it'll be a good jumping off point to look at all of the basics. But no matter what approach plate you're looking at, each one is going to be split into six sections. That's the margin identification, the briefing strip, the plan view, the profile view, an airport sketch, and the landing minimums. To start off, we'll look at the margin identification. This is the first section. The top, bottom, and sides of the chart all contain a margin identifier. So to take a look at what's on here a little closer, we'll see first the city and state that the airport's located in, Westminster, Maryland in this case. And then there's an identifier for a numbering system and then the, in parentheses, the responsible organization. In this case, it's the FAA. It could be the US Air Force or another military organization responsible for it. In civilian flight, most of what we're gonna be looking at are, are FAA controlled charts. This number represents the last uh, date or the last update to the instrument approach procedure. And it's written a little strangely, I think. It's uh, the first two digits are the year and then the, uh, the, the rest of the digits are the number of days into that year. So this approach procedure was last updated 140 days into 2021. So roughly about a third of the way through the year. And most importantly, maybe, is the uh, actual procedure title. So what we have here, it's the VOR Runway 34. So the VOR is the type of navigation aid that uh, is being used for the approach and then the runway that the approach is to. Not all approaches go to a specific runway, but this one uh, provides for a straight in approach to runway 34 using a VOR. Finally, you have the name of the airport and the identifier. So this is the Carroll County Airport. And then the identifier in parentheses, Delta Mike Whiskey. And then the, obviously the full four digit or the four character one would be Kilo Delta Mike Whiskey, but that's left off the uh, FAA chart here. From the sides of the uh, margin identifier are the volume identifier, Northeast 3, and then you have the dates of, of effectiveness. So this approach procedure, this plate is effective from the 17th of June 2021 up to the 15th of July 2021. They get updated every 28 days. So moving on from margin identification, we'll have a look at the briefing strip, the second element. So the briefing strip is split into three different stacks. The top stack is procedural information. So there's the primary navigation type and ID and frequency. So this is the VOR approach. So the primary navigation is gonna be off the VORTAC at EMI, which is the identifier for the Westminster VOR or the Westminster VORTAC. And then you have a frequency on there, 117.9, and then a uh, channel 126 for military use for the, uh, the same identifier. Next to that, you have the uh, inbound approach course. So this would be the final approach course for the uh, approach, 358 degrees magnetic, obviously. And then to the right, you have some runway landing information. So here we have the available landing distance of 5,100 feet. That acronym TDZE stands for Touchdown Zone Elevation, which is 788 feet, and then an airport elevation of 789 feet. Notice that the airport elevation and the touchdown zone elevation are gonna be a little bit different. Obviously, different parts of the airport are gonna be at different elevations because of, of hills or, or whatever is on the airport uh, field environment. Moving down, we have the middle strip. This has some more information. Over on the left are procedure notes. Uh, so th these can be pretty extensive. On this procedure, there's really not a lot there. We just have uh, a couple of um, symbols, the, the upside down black triangle with a T, the regular side triangle with an A, and then NA next to it. Other videos here will get into what's in these procedure notes, but you would see things like uh, equipment requirements, uh, indicators for takeoff or alternate minimums, um, and then a whole uh, list of other exceptions and things that might apply to like helicopter approaches. Um, but we'll leave this pretty bare for this uh, purpose of this basic discussion here. You'll often also see a symbol that will give you an idea of the approach lighting system for the uh, uh, runway and the approach. This particular runway isn't going to have any approach lighting, so we don't see that on here. But we do have, off, off to the right, the missed approach textual description. 
This is going to be the first of three places on this approach chart that you have a description of the missed approach procedure. This is the textual description. And you can just read it right there, climbing left turn 2,900, direct to the EMI Vortac and hold. And down below on the bottom briefing strip, you have some communications information that are going to be relevant for the approach. Off the left, you have weather on 121.25. You've got the approach control. In this case, it's Potomac approach on 125.52. GCO, which is a ground communication outlet, which is basically a way to get in touch with air traffic control from the ground for something like a, a clearance or to, or to close an IFR flight plan. And then you have the Unicom. This is an uncontrolled airport. So the, so the Unicom and the CTAF are going to be on that 122.7 frequency. Then you have that L symbol, which means that you can control lighting using that frequency as well. So moving on from the briefing strip is the third section, which is the plan view. So this is a top-down or bird's-eye view of the instrument approach. The first thing is that the nav aid is indicated. This is going to be the primary nav aid for the approach. And it gives you similar information in the same way that you might see on a sectional chart. You have the facility name, which is the Westminster VOR. You have the identifier EMI, the frequency 117.9, and that Morse identifier, and down below the channel 126 for, for military use. A couple of the approach segments are going to be listed here. So this approach is relatively basic in that it doesn't have that many approach segments, but they're all depicted here. The first one being the hold in lieu of procedure turn. So that's depicted on the, the racetrack, the solid line racetrack. If it was dotted or dashed, it would be a uh, just a traditional hold, but this is a procedure turn or hold in lieu of procedure turn. And then the next segment is the final approach segment. It goes straight from that VOR, uh, the Westminster VOR, all the way onto the uh, final approach segment down to the runway, just to the top of where that arrow is pointed at. And then there's the missed approach segment. This is the second of the three descriptions of the missed approach, and it's just shown there a little graphically. It's just that left turn, and then the arrow is pointing you right back to the Westminster VOR. Over on the left here, this circle is going to indicate minimum safe altitudes. Uh, minimum safe altitudes, or MSA, is for emergency use. Uh, it basically provides a thousand feet of clearance over all obstructions within the sector. So when you're on an instrument approach and you're talking to air traffic control, you're likely going to be assigned an altitude. So again, these altitudes are, are there for you to know what safe altitude or minimum safe altitudes are there in case you're not able to get in contact or you have some other emergency where you would need to know this. They typically work about 25 nautical miles out from uh, some identifier. In this case, it's going to be the Westminster VOR. And sometimes you'll see them split into sectors like this. So to the north and to the west uh, of the VOR, you have a minimum safe altitude of 3,400 feet, whereas to the south and to the east of it, that minimum safe altitude is a little bit lower, down to 2,600. So after the plan view, we have the profile view of the approach. So this has a lot of the same information as the plan view. It's just that rather than a top-down view, we're looking at it from the side or from the profile. This shows the vertical approach path from the side. So it's the same approach segments as the plan view. So if you look at the right side here, this is the same as that hold in lieu of procedure turn from before. And if we bring in that graphic, you can see that it's depicting the same thing. It's just that the plan view from before has it from the top and the profile view has it from the side. So moving on from that hold in lieu of procedure onto the final approach segment, again, the same as you'd see on the plan view. It's just that one's from the top and one's from the side. And the same thing with the missed approach segment. So down below where it's highlighted, you have the uh, depiction of the climbing turn out from the, uh, from the runway or the missed approach point. But then notice up top, you have a graphical depiction. So this is going to be the third of the three depictions of the missed approach procedure. And it's sort of shown sequentially. So the first thing you do is you make a left climbing turn up to 2,900 feet and then you proceed direct to the EMI, to the, to the Westminster VOR. And we can just sort of match that up with the depiction of the missed approach on the plan view, same thing. And then just to bring it all home, there's the textual description. So we basically have all three of the depictions of the missed approach procedure in one spot right there. After the profile view, we'll have a look at the airport sketch. 
So this is somewhat familiar to an airport diagram or a taxiway diagram for an airport, albeit maybe with a little bit less detail. You're not seeing uh, the taxiways um, uh, letters, identifiers on there or anything like that, but a lot of the same type of information. So uh, you're seeing the runway pattern, related information, runway dimensions, airport elevation, touchdown zone elevation. You'll have indications of what lighting is available, so that P in a circle on both ends of the runway indicates PAPI lights, and then you'll also have indication that you have uh, a runway end identifier lights and medium intensity runway lights. That's the REIL and MIRL at the bottom left there. Sometimes what you see, if it's applicable, is a time and distance table for the approach. What this does is it gives you the distance and the time that's required to go from the final approach fix to the missed approach point at selected ground speed. So for example, if you're going from the Westminster VOR at 90 knots, um, there that second column on the chart is gonna tell you that it takes four minutes and 20 seconds to get from the final approach fix to the missed approach point. Why do they do this? Because on certain approaches, this approach being one example of which you're not able to identify the missed approach point. So how do you know when to go missed? How do you know when to execute a missed approach? In the case of this approach, you need to start the timer. So it's a little bit of a traditional way of doing it. If you're going 90 knots ground speed, it's gonna take you four minutes and 20 seconds. So if you've been on the final approach segment for that amount of time and you don't see the runway, it's time to go missed. So now the last section is the landing minimum section. And this is gonna contain the lowest altitude and visibility requirements for the approach. So there's minimums for straight in and there's minimums for circling or circle to lands. And the minimums are the minimum descent altitude or the decision altitude and the visibility. So the, and the minimums are also depicted for each aircraft category. Aircraft categories are based on the approach speed of the aircraft. So basically the faster you fly, the further to the right on this chart you'd be and the more restrictive those minimums get. So if we look here, we see a minimum descent altitude for this S34, this straight in approach to runway 34. We have a minimum descent altitude of 1,480 feet. So basically this means that if the cloud ceiling is below that, we're not gonna be able to see the runway when we get to that minimum altitude. And then that number one there, the dash one, means that the minimum visibility is one statute mile. Over on the right there, this figure is called the height above the threshold, 692 feet. So whereas that 1480 figure is like MSL, so that's gonna, what you're gonna read off the altimeter when you're flying, you can think of the 692 as above ground level. And just to kind of bring the concept home, let's take the touchdown zone elevation from the chart, which was 788 feet, and let's see if we can work out how these figures sort of relate to each other. So if we take the touchdown zone elevation of 788 feet and the height above the threshold or the height above the touchdown of 692 and we add those together, that gets us to our minimum descent altitude of 1480. So if there, you ever have confusion about what these numbers mean, just see if you can work out these relationships for yourself and you should be able to, to work into one or the other just by adding or subtracting two of them. And you notice uh, in category C here, the numbers change a little bit for the straight in approach. We still have a minimum descent altitude of 1,480 feet MSL, but the visibility requirements have gone from one mile to two miles. The rationale here is that a faster aircraft, an aircraft that's moving faster on the approach is gonna require a little bit better visibility, it's gonna require a little bit better weather in order to uh, be able to get visual sight of the runway and proceed down to land. So as we get faster, that tends to change. And you see over there, uh, column D, uh, a much faster aircraft is, is going to be NA, not allowed to do this approach. What are those numbers in parentheses, like 700-1? Those relate to military operations, so they're not applicable to civil aircraft. So that's just a quick rundown of the basics that you'll see on every instrument approach procedure, those six elements. Now, obviously, we'll get into a lot more detail when we look at specific types of approaches, like precision approaches, non-precision approaches, RNAVs, ILSs, what have you. There's a lot to get in there. But just remember, when you're first looking at some of these plates, these are the six segments that you're going to see on each one of them.